So you didn't watch the Super Bowl. Oh, the football game. The football yeah, yeah. game. Where the guys run around with jerseys, <laughs> and there's a bunch of people in the stands with their different men's names on the back, and they're cheering them on, <laughs> and they're betting their life savings on something they can't control. You're talking about that Super Bowl? Think about how much these athletes get paid. How much do we pay our teachers? How much do we pay our police? How much do we pay our military? What is the one time people seek God? When they're needy. When they're scared. The Bible says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna lead people in the wrong way. I think the best way to learn is to experience it. How do you overcome fear? Fear of what? Of a Zoom call? Of cold calling? What are you fearful of? If I don't produce XYZ result as a CEO, the company goes to crap. I'm a billionaire by the time I'm 50. My parents are dead, bro. Like, why the fuck would I be frugal? I would rather take a little bit longer to get the big B so I get the mental. <laughs> you were broke 12 months ago, and now you're a millionaire, technically. That I was and that I am. What has changed for you in the last 12 months? What is the biggest difference in yourself now today than 12 months ago, just a year ago when you were broke? Belief. Belief. In what? In myself. How did you cultivate belief in yourself? Why didn't you believe in yourself 12 months ago? Because I didn't work enough yet. I outworked the self-doubt in the right vehicle. Mm. And I've mm. worked for a long time, but it wasn't in the right vehicle. So you outworked your self-doubt. You just put in reps and you overcame your limiting beliefs? It's that simple? It's simple. <laughs> Everyone says they do the affirmations. I know you like your journaling, so I'm not gonna crap on it too much. But everyone wants to write stuff in the mirror, pull the David Goggins, do all that good stuff. Bro, just go to fucking work. <laughs> just go to work and make it unreasonable not to have the belief. Mm. Unreasonable. Absolutely unreasonable. But I'm scared. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Then don't. <laughs> then don't, bro. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a good one, boy. You're going to live in shame, and your family will shame you forever for being scared. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't. Hold on. I'm tired of these people trying to give motivation. Like, bro, if you don't want to do it, don't. Don't. So, okay. <laughs> I see where you're coming from. But fear is a real thing, and it blocks a lot of people. How do you overcome fear? I mean, what is fear? What do you mean by fear? Do you ever feel nervous, anxious, outside your comfort zone? Like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, I don't know if I'm fit for this. Oh, I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I can achieve the thing I'm trying to achieve. Brother, brother, we live in 2024. Correct. Okay, we live in 2024. We live in the United States of America, the best country in the world. Okay? Following. My grandfather was in the Holocaust. Half of his family killed in front of him. Mm. Fear of what? Fear of what? Of a Zoom call? Of cold calling? What are you fearful of? What about all the people in Palestine getting blown to shreds? Mm. What are you fearful of? And if it's true fear, if you truly fear, fear fearful, try to be selfless for a second. Think about your family mm. and think about the impact that you can make and get to work. This is the easiest time ever in human history. We can eat whenever we want. We can go to nice places. We don't need to hunt. Everything is given to us. We have the internet. People get dopamine sp spikes from school on their phone. It's easiest to travel anywhere in the world. You can hop on a flight for $50. I think that's the reason why people are so afraid. For what reason? Because they haven't had to go through the things that build the character, that build the courage, that require the courage. Courage is not a requirement anymore in life. It's not a requirement. If you don't have courage, you're not a man. Why? 
that, in my opinion, that is a characteristic of anyone that you would consider a man's courage. Have man. you always had courage? No. No. Hmm. Interesting. So how did you develop courage? There was a point in my life where I turned 18 years old, 19 years old. I understood that I had to go into the real world and things just need to get done. I don't think like, it's just, it's instinct for men. Maybe if you're jerking off every day and a vegan and all this stuff and your testosterone is low, like maybe, maybe that's it, bro. Maybe it's just testosterone is so low that no one has any balls. They shrink and they shrivel. Maybe that's it, bro. Maybe it's testosterone. Seriously, bro. Maybe it's the water. Maybe it's the air. Maybe it's all this stuff. It's but the that's vegans. just cope. It's the bro, vegans. Me and my friends, we have a saying. You know Lone Survivor? No. You never watched it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, his name is Marcus Luttrell, right? Yeah. Okay. I know. He was in Afghanistan. Yeah. All of his friends were killed around him in a, in a mission, right? Yep. He got shot 17 times. 17 times, slept in a pool of his own blood, escaped the Taliban, and he finally was able to get back to the U.S. This guy got shot 17 times and survived and made it out. You're scared of taking a cold call. Bro, people, my, it's funny because Tony and I will always say this. I'll be like, Tony, like, I got like no sleep last night, bro. Like, I'm tired, yada, yada, yada. Marcus Cho got shot 17 times. Fuck. <laughs> You're right, bro. I'm not tired. Mm. It's perspective, bro. Everyone has such an easy life. That is great perspective. I was mentioning this earlier. I was talking to my childhood best friend who's a Green Beret yesterday and catching up with that dude. And when he was going through Green Beret training, Green Berets, for people who don't know, they're like Navy SEALs with brains. Savages. <laughs> they basically, Savages. what Green Berets do is they're US Special Forces. You take like 10 Green Berets, you send them to a country in the Middle East and Africa and South America, and they train the local militia to overthrow the governments. Yeah. So it's like eight, nine dudes. <laughs> They go and they- Middle of nowhere, they, no support. They, no support, they <laughs> drop them in and they figure out how to train an army out of a local like town. Like Bro. imagine your neighborhood needed to fight uh, the Taliban. That's what Green Berets do. They, they, insane savages. And as he's been going through Green Beret training, he tells me more and more about what he has to do and the things that happen to him. And I can't share all the things, but it's crazy because just five years ago, I remember when he, like, he's a tough dude, yeah? But I remember when he was crying about cardio at basketball practice and he didn't want to keep running the suicides and he was giving up on our two mile sprints. And like, I think what happened to him is he put himself in a situation where there was no other option, where he was required. This is what I, like, the man, Frederick Nietzsche said, the man who has a strong enough why can bear almost any how. So if you have a big enough reason you can get shot 17 times, assuming none of them are fatal, and you can keep persevering because I guarantee you Marcus Luttrell, somewhere in his brain, he, had, he had, was thinking about his family, he was thinking about his country, he said, I need to survive this. I need to go through this. And when you lose that need, you quit. So I think, I think the biggest problem for most people is not that they aren't capable, it's that they don't have a reason for forcing their capability. Mm. They don't have a big enough reason, a big enough why, to go become the person that they're capable of becoming. That's why it all starts with why. It mm. all starts with why am I doing this in the first place? If your why is to make money, if your why is to get rich, if your why is to flex on your ex, it's not strong enough. It isn't. It's not strong you enough. It's completely selfish and it's completely fragile. But if you think selflessly, I think that's the secret. If you start thinking about all the people who need you, all the people who need you right now, your family, your friends, your country, your, your world, your race, your species needs you. It's a war out here. And we yes. can talk about that later. It's a war out here. So when you start thinking about that, like, dude, I used to be so scared. I used to be so scared. I, st I still get scared. I mean, maybe I'm not as uh, Marcus Luttrell as you, but I still, I still get it now. But what helps me is saying, dude, this isn't even about me. Mm. <laughs> like, I'm on a mission. And because I'm on that mission, I go, no matter what it is that I have to do, I go. No matter how you feel. It's required. Correct. It's required. So I really love what you just said. On that note, let's, uh, let's talk about a lot of things. We got a lot of things to discuss with you. The Super Bowl was 
few days ago. It's probably be a while when what people Super are watching Bowl? this, but this. <laughs> what are you talking about? You didn't watch the Super Bowl? Super Bowl? <laughs> so you didn't watch the Super Bowl. What it was a few days Bowl? ago. Everybody's going crazy about it, all the all the stuff that happened. Oh, the football game. The football yeah, game. Yeah. Where the guys run around with jerseys, <laughs> and there's a bunch of people in the stands with their different men's names on the back, and they're cheering them on, <laughs> and they're betting their life savings on something they can't control. You're talking about that Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah. So, why, so I mean, you didn't watch, I take it you didn't watch the game. Well, no. Why not? <laughs> Dude, I'm not watching a bunch of men tackle each other on a screen. <laughs> it's not really my thing. Dude, if you get off to that, so be it. It's okay. Why, why would you tell, would you recommend people who don't have money to not watch entertainment? People who watch football, either extremely poor or extremely rich. You're either Taylor Swift in the uh, skybox, or you're someone losing their life savings to see if a running back scores seven or more points. <laughs> <laughs> it is the biggest. Football is the matrix. Dude, have I, have I told you about the uh, Roman circus? No. So, okay. What you're, you're right, it is the matrix. Think about how much these athletes get paid. Hundreds of millions of dollars. How much do we pay our teachers? How much do we pay our police? How much do we pay our military? Bro, my friend, the Green Beret, Special Forces, you know how much he makes? 40. Bro, he worked 17 hours the other day. He makes $100 a day. He made less than minimum wage. And he's the, he's the reason, people like him are the reason our country's here. It's unreal. It's <laughs> he absolutely makes less than minimum unreal. wage, but fucking, LaDainian Tomlinson <laughs> <laughs> makes 50 million a year. <laughs> Eric Bledsoe goes three for 10 from the field and he makes 20 million a year. It's because of the Roman circus. It's because of the Roman circus. So what check is this the Roman out. Circus? Back in ancient Rome, when wars were happening, when rape was fluid throughout the streets, when people were being murdered and crucified, when taxes were raised, when there was chaos and havoc in the country, what did the Roman emperor do? He threw a circus. Mm. And he said, everybody go to the circus. There's gonna be excitement and entertainment. People are gonna kill each other. They're gonna battle to the death. And you are going to watch, and you are going to enjoy, and you're gonna have a good time. And you're gonna forget about all the evil and havoc and war and trauma that is happening in our country right now because we threw a circus. Mm. Football, the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, it's a circus. It's the modern Roman circus. That's what it is. And people fall victim to it and they don't even know. Damn straight. <laughs> it's Damn pretty straight. Fucking and once and I like love the NBA growing up. I love Bro, football. I was the biggest New York Giants fan you ever find. <laughs> ever. I had the cards. I used to trade football cards <laughs> like nobody's business. And then once I realized, like, wait, this is literally all a scam. What am I doing? They, it's it's actually insane. Do you think it's as diabolical as some people make it out to be with like the matrix like people like tate and belmar and uh Godzi with like the deep yeah. state do you think it's that dark and cynical i think that it can be that dark and cynical but probably just in a different way i think that they know what they're doing they must definitely know what they're doing um and the easiest Who, way tate or the other guys everyone tate does too is tate the matrix tate is a matrix so we'll talk about this in a second i know you want to go into this um but in general what's the easiest way to build a cult following, to have a common what? To have a common enemy. Okay. And what is the easiest common en enemy to build? As the government. As right now in today's society. The, the elites. The elites. But that doesn't mean the elites are not bad. It's just a way to gather a following. It's a great point. You gotta be careful with these people who are always pointing to some other evil source. Not that it's not real, but if that is the backbone of their message, that's, that's sketchy. That's a little bit sketchy. I, I don't know. I don't know. There is evil in the world, though. But you're right. When you say the Matrix is out to get you, you're not just saying, like, oh, I can help you become more successful. You're saying, I can help, you sa I can help save you from evil. I can help save you from these people who are trying to ruin your life. And it's that protection that's hidden in that marketing message that's so... Yeah powerful especially the young impressionable kids most definitely so i i the personally question is, like do you do it for good or do you do it for bad fair 
That's the question because everyone's going to market. There's going to be someone that's gathering all the attention. It's going to be through one of these tactics. So I would hope it's someone that's doing good for the world rather than bad. Fair, but... And if you want to speak on Tate, we can speak on that The now. path to hell is paved with good intentions. Okay. So a lot of these people, I think, start off with magnanimous goals in mind. They want to do well. They want to serve others. They want to provide help and support. And they want to actually do something positive. And they're benefactors at heart. But then the heart gets corrupted because greed comes into play. Okay. And they lose their original reason for starting. I think a lot of politicians started off with good intentions. I think a lot of musicians started off with good intentions. I think a lot of celebrities started off with really good intentions. I think a lot of online entrepreneurs and gurus started off with good intentions. But the path to hell is paved with good intentions because people forget their good intentions on the journey and they sell out and they become corrupted. So the question is, who's been corrupted and who hasn't? And that is a very tough question to answer. Now let me ask you, who do you think has been corrupted and who do you think still has good intentions? The music industry is corrupted oh, completely. That's for sure. Complete. I didn't believe it. Like when people started telling me conspiracy theories about the diabolical nature and the satanic nature of the music industry, I was like, nah, you're dude, conspiracy theory. I've never been much of a conspiracy theorist. Like I think we very went to satanic. the moon. I don't think 9-11 was a hoax. And maybe, I don't know, I haven't looked into it. But the music We're industry, the music industry is run by Satan, brother. <laughs> it's run by Satan himself. We were listening earlier to the Drake song. <laughs> and he, what, what, did, what did he do at the end? He went, he was like, shh, 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 six, 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 six. He does it in a ton of songs. He does it in a ton of songs. He talks about how if the devil's in the details, then I'm satanic. Have you heard that bar? I don't listen to music. Yeah, you shouldn't. Dude, cr cutting out devil music is one cutting of the best things I've ever done. No, I listen to worship. I listen to music Gospel. from God. That's helpful. But cutting out the satanic music is so hard because it's so addicting. But once you actually get rid of it, like, dude, it, it actually does change the way you see the world. It's kind of crazy. I agree. Who do, I you, think... who do you think has been corrupted? Who do I think has been corrupted? Who do you think hasn't been corrupted? That's the question. I, I, don't, I don't think it's as black and white as saying who has been corrupted and who hasn't. Now, I, you can list off a bunch of people and I can say if, if I think they have good intentions or bad. Hermosi. I think he has good in intentions, but he delivers it poorly. How do you mean? Bro, I just can never align with the nihilist. Oh, the nihilism. He thinks everything is meaningless. He talks about, about his family all the time. I understand if you had not the best childhood. I understand if your parents didn't believe in you. I get it. That's okay. But when you're speaking with highly impressionable young entrepreneurs, you have to be very, very, very cognizant of how you speak. And he pushes a message that can be perceived as a coping mechanism to not go home for the holidays and not speak to your family just because they aren't fully all in. I have so many friends where their family didn't believe in them. They still love them, love them to the death because of their family, but they still did their own thing. One of my guys, Shark, his family, he didn't talk to his parents for like a year after he left college. He freaking talks to them now and he loves them. You don't need to mm -hmm. stop loving your parents and stop you know, spending time with them just mm. because they don't believe what mission you're on. That's powerful. That was definitely the case for me growing up because I left school after ninth grade. My mom didn't believe in me at all. Um, love her to death, but I, I shouldn't say she didn't believe, me, believe in me at all, but my mom did not believe in me not going to college. Neither did my dad, any of my friends, my brothers, anything. Nobody thought I was going to make it. Nobody thought I was going to be successful. I think one of the most important things I've had to do, character-wise, is forgive them. But you know what's interesting is once you forgive people, that fuel that they give you starts to go away. Mm. So I think what Hermosi has is a lot of pent up, and I don't say this out of judgment, like I can't judge, I was the same exact way, in a lot of ways I still am with certain people, but it's, it's that pent up pride that keeps you going to say, I haven't done enough yet. I still haven't proved them wrong. I need to keep going until I'm at a billion. 
Yeah. And then I get to a billion, I say it's still not enough. Yeah. But that is a never ending game. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Mm. That's what Jesus said. So, okay, Hermosi, you think does have good intentions. What about Patrick Bet David? Good intentions. Luke Belmar. I don't really know him to be honest. I know you have your your skits around him that are funny, but I've only like heard Luke. his his nice wordplay. He's definitely uh <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely good with his words. He's very, very magniloquent yeah, and yeah. loquacious. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty comical, but it makes sense. Like most of it's on point. So, okay, let's take a few steps back. I've become convinced that becoming successful is not about what you do. It's not even about how you do it. It's about who you are. Okay. And that too many people are getting focused on the vehicle, the object, the mechanism, and they're forgetting about the person operating the machine. They're too focused on the machine, they're forgetting about the person who's operating the machine. My goal is to become a person that is capable, no matter what vehicle they are in, to go from point A to point B. You put me in SAS, I survive. You put me in Ecom, I survive. You put me in SMMA, I survive. You put me in Info, I survive. You put me in Local Business, I survive. And I think I've developed those skills to where, dude, you put me in any vehicle, I'm gonna win. Yep. It's because I focused on the who. So I'm, I'm curious for you, Josh, what have you learned about becoming, would you agree with that sentiment? And if so, how have you become the who? Like what are some tactical things perhaps that you've done? Let me ask you that first. How have you became, became the who? Because it's very similar to the answer that I, I first stated in the beginning. I think you literally have to rewire your brain. And I think there's a few ways you do that. I think the number one thing you have to do, everybody's focused on more, more, more. What else do I need to do? What else do I need to consume? What else do I need to learn? It actually starts with addition from subtraction. So less is more, right? You get more from doing less. And what I mean is you start to cut things off that are toxic to you and are negative and detrimental to you. And once you start to remove layer by layer by layer, you start to open up and you start to realize more of your true potential. So getting rid of the devil music, getting rid of the social media, getting rid of the tap water and the poisonous foods, getting all, all that stuff is actually real. It actually does have an impact. Getting rid, most importantly, of the negative people. Mm. Getting rid of the negative people, getting rid, and I don't mean just getting rid of them completely, I mean starting to spend less and less time with the people who don't believe in you, the parents, the friends, the family members, starting to remove those people from your life. And instead, what I did, I replaced them with online people that I could look up to. Because there wasn't anybody in Waxhaw, North Carolina that was worth <laughs> surrounding myself with. I promise you that. But what I did is I found the people online. I joined the free Facebook groups. I joined the school communities. I joined the discords. And I started to meet people and like make online friends who were on the same mission, who had the same beliefs, who thought that they were capable of more than anybody I'd ever met. Like I had friends who were 18 saying, I want to run for president. And whether or not they had a shot, I don't care. I want to be with the motherfucker who wants to run for president. <laughs> you want to run? Dude, I, go. Go. I'm with you. Because 1% chance you win? I know, I know that motherfucker. I was with him since day one. I'm the VP, baby. I'll put on a wig. Whatever I got to do, bro. So, so that was my thought process. Is that, dude, when I got around those people, my life changed. When I got around the people who believed in themselves, so much so that they also believed in others, that's a powerful thing. You want to know somebody who's truly confident, truly has belief, their belief passes on to the people around mm. them. That's it's really so good. strong that they're like, dude, I know you can do it because I remember how, how I, I thought. thought that nothing yeah. was possible and I remember what I've achieved now and I know it's so real that I think you can do it too. That's when you real. get around those motherfuckers, you win. That's real. Yeah. So that, that'd be my, uh, my thoughts, my experience. But um, let's pull up some questions. We, got some, we went to Instagram, we got some questions. There are a lot of SMMA questions. No, 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 no SMMA questions. So you and I were talking about this the other day. Everybody wants to talk about sales, marketing, all these things, but nobody talks about the most important skill in seven figures, eight figures, nine figures, in really winning in business. 
What's the most important skill? Building a product. Leadership. Oh, leadership. Leadership. Yeah. So how many team members do you have? As of right now, I don't know, 18. Six months ago, you had like one. Me. Like what have you year. learned about building teams? Because none of the gurus really talk about this because it's so freaking hard. It's yeah. hard. What have you learned about leadership? I think there's a lot of learning lessons along the way. And I think the best way to learn is to experience it. You kind of just have to dive in because you're not going to be perfect. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that when you're building any business and even the SMA, because I'm sure there's a bunch of kids that are, have agencies watching this, right? That's your audience. Um, you just got to be that dude. And if, even if you don't feel like you're that dude yet, you got to fake it till you make it, especially when you have team members around you. Um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to lead people in the wrong way. You, big thing for me was I, I got a lot really friendly with some of the team members, especially on the sales side. Mm. And that hurt us. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to make friends. I'm not, I'm here to get to the goal. Yeah. I'm here to achieve the mission. I always used to tell my dad that my team's like a family. I'm like, Dad, it's really like a family here. <laughs> you call you an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> it's really like a family at our company. My dad, my dad was at one point uh, VP of HR for a Fortune 100 company. So, you know, like tens of thousands of indirect reports. Like HR was his thing. That's what he got paid to do was manage, hire, and train people. Yeah. And when I told my dad, who I didn't realize was actually like a genius at HR, I thought HR was like lame and like paperwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was really young, this was like two years ago. I was like, dad, our team's like a family. He's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean it's not good? People yeah. love it, people yeah. are having fun. It's easy to be a family in peacetime, but when wartime comes around, they're, they're looking at you as, a family member, they're looking at you as a friend, they're not looking at you as a leader. Mm. They're not looking at you as somebody who can take them from point A to point B. And great leaders make you feel safe. Yep. And when it becomes wartime, the leader has to make the team feel safe. That's a big thing I've learned over the last year. But it's hard to do that when you're buddy-buddy with everybody. It's yeah, one of the like biggest the mistakes people make. Field, yeah. yeah, yeah, they need to view, people will not follow somebody below them. No, they will not. So if you start to put yourself on their same level, it's too risky. Too risky. You, you have know, to same keep level, yourself. It's hard. It's hard to follow someone. Yeah. How do you keep yourself in a positive way above your team to the sense where they want to keep following you or the people around you in general? Because I think a lot of the people around you look up to you and want to follow you. So how do you become somebody worth following and keep that? Yeah. I think the people around me, I just grew up. I had to mature. Um, been living by myself for a long time, so that helped. But people on the team, how did I maintain that respect? I mean, even though I was friendly with them, and that's one big mistake I made, I would always call them on their, on their BS. Mm. Always, always. Um, and me holding them accountable and having those hard conversations and having the abundance and the willingness to let people go, and they knew, that, hey, there's someone behind me, if, if I have to be let go, it, it creates respect mm. <laughs> and it creates hard work because they know if they can't produce XYZ, XYZ result, then they're not staying on the team. If I don't produce XYZ result as a CEO, the company goes to crap, right? So the harder you work as well, especially in the beginning, I think leading from the front is the easiest way to get respect now that I'm thinking about it. Mm. So... Not if you have a small team and it's your first time leading people, the easiest way to gain respect is by outworking everyone by 10x. Mm. Even if someone thinks they're on the same level playing field as you, right, or maybe even below you, right, and they're on your team, if you're working the 16 hours a day and they're working eight, like, they're listening to you. So if you're struggling with something or you're struggling with gaining respect from your team and you're very small, I would say that's the easiest way to at least start and get the, the ball rolling in the right direction is just outworking everyone. That's actually really, really good advice. Lead yourself first yeah. and the people will follow. I think another, Joel Kaplan gave me this advice on a podcast we did. He said, I asked him like, what's the biggest leadership lesson you've learned? And he paused and thought about it. It's not an easy question to answer. Leadership's a very challenging topic. It is. 
he basically said, people are going to follow your actions, not your words. And I thought that was important. Yeah. If you want to really lead people, it comes down to not what you say, but what you do. And it's easy to give off the right things and say the right things in leadership. It's hard to actually do the right thing. Another thing that I've, I've learned here, I forget who I heard say this, but they were like, if you want to lead, you need character, you need integrity. So how do you do that? Because it's very easy to like take advantage of your team in some ways. Like it's very easy to yell, go bananas, like be unfair to them. Like it's really easy to mess up in leadership. So what the guy said, I forget who said this, but he was like, imagine that the whole world can see how you're handling the situation. Mm. How would you handle it if the entire world was looking in with a microscope on you in that situation? How would you treat them? What would you say? How would you handle it behind closed doors? And I think that's great advice for any interaction, any interaction. with anyone. Yeah. How do you handle the girl who curves you? How do you handle the friend who you're beefing with? How do you handle the upset family member? How do you handle the upset client? If the whole world was watching you in that interaction, how would you handle yourself? Agreed. So I think that's an interesting framework as well. We got some questions about God. Well, before we even get into that, somebody asked, what question should I be asking you that I'm not thinking of? So for all the people watching this right now that want to become more successful, that want to make more money, that want to live a better life, that want to come and rent out the Israeli royal family member's house in Costa Rica for a month. I don't know if I told you that's whose house this is, but really? yeah, it used to belong to a royal family member from Israel. Uh, what should they be asking that they aren't? Well, I wouldn't want to tell them. That's the real <laughs> sauce. So you're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> but, no, that's my go-to question too. What should I be when asking I, you? I, yeah, when I don't know what to ask someone. What should I ask you that I'm not? So when you ask somebody like Matt Ryder, multi-eight-figure entrepreneur, Eddie Malouf, multi-eight-figure entrepreneur, what do they say when you say, hey, what should I be asking you that I'm not? With Matt Ryder, is like finances. Mm. Dude, he wouldn't stop about accounting. I remember I paid him like six or eight grand for one hour, right? One hour of his time. And I was like, all right, I have this plan. I'm going to ask him X, Y, Z about my agency. Like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to help the sales team. Bro, I have the recording. The first hour, I am sitting there watching Matt go through his freaking Excel sheet, one line by one line, month by month, penny by penny, all the way to 2028. Mm. exactly where he wants to go with different offers. And I was just sitting there like, bro, like, what am I like? Hey, Grant, just watch that. But it gave me perspective, right? And it gave me what, like, what his mind is thinking about all day, yeah. um, which is interesting. Yeah. So that's what I got from that. Good dude. Because the truth, like, if you get your, fi like, if he saves you $1,000 a month for the next two years, boom, 3X, $24,000 saved. $12,000 saved a year, you go to sell to 4X multiple, it's $50,000 saved. Yeah. One, it's actually so powerful. If you're at that 10K, 15K, 20K a month, 100K a month range, one of the best things you can do is not add revenue, but decrease expenses. Mm. Because it takes you X amount of investment to get another $5,000 worth of revenue, but what's the easiest thing you can do is just go tack off $2,000 of expenses. And they're, they're in your P&L. Jared and I have a trim the fat meeting twice a month where we hop on, we go down the P&L line by line by line by line. What did we overspend on? What did we waste money on? What can we cut out? What's not necessary? What can we automate? Who can we bring in to replace these softwares we're using? That's why we hired a wizard. We need to start doing that because we're need to bleeding start doing cash. But you did how much in profit last month? Uh, over 100. <laughs> and we're Not still bad. bleeding. You're still bleeding. <laughs> we're bleeding a lot. Dude, but that's crazy though. Your margins could probably, like instead of, let's say it's 100, they could probably could be 120. Yeah. Maybe 110, 115. That's another six figures a year. This month, God willing. Th that's why the, the most successful entrepreneurs, if you read the book Outsiders, it's, it was Warren Buffett's favorite book for a long time. It's about eight unorthodox CEOs and how they beat the S&P 500 and how they beat the greatest CEO of all time, Jack Welch. Jack Welch, who was CEO of uh, GE, was widely considered the greatest CEO of all time. 
but these eight unorthodox CEOs completely outperformed Jack Welch. And one of the most, one of the most surprising commonalities is the way they viewed money. They were all very, very, very frugal. Jeff Bezos was very frugal. He is very frugal. Well, he spent 60 million on a clock, but besides that, he's very frugal. The most successful entrepreneurs have frugality in mind. That's why when I see the luxury spending from a lot of these online gurus, you know what I do, Josh? I see them buying all the nice things, all the nice cars, and I say, you're never gonna become a billionaire. <laughs> you're never gonna make a billion because you don't actually know the game. You know how to make seven figures. You know how to make eight figures. You know how to flash your lifestyle, but you don't know what it actually takes to become one of the greatest. And you learn that by studying the greats. Charlie Munger said there's billion dollar answers in a $50 history book. That's why great entrepreneurs that. study great entrepreneurs. Do you study any great entrepreneurs? <laughs> I need to do more of it. And yes. I'm definitely not Super frugal, I'm not gonna lie. I think abundance is important. Depends on what level you're trying to get to. Agreed. Dude, but these I don't billionaire think, CEOs I don't think every are frugal. billionaire is super frugal like that. I just not, don't wanna live. Not once they get there. Not once they get there, but what about, so cool. Let's say life goes amazing, right? Some so, aren't, that's fair, some aren't. Say, say life goes amazing, right? And I'm, I'm a billionaire by the time I'm 50. My parents are dead, bro. Like, why the fuck would I be frugal? I would rather take a little bit longer to get the big B so I get the mental. <laughs> then I would rather take care of all the people around me and have, like, and, and provide for people. I don't, bro, screw frugality. <laughs> like, I don't fuck that, bro. Oh, I'm spending money. Let's get into our debates, shall we? <laughs> okay. I understand investing in the people around you and using your finances for that. I, I understand that and that makes sense. I think the problem is this idea that's been perpetuated that a flashy lifestyle is a successful life. And I, that's, I think, what I I'm somewhat the antithesis of, even though we are in this really nice house. This is like, this is the one thing I love investing in is nice houses. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I'll, I'll bite my words We're on We're in everything. a huge Costa Rican villa with a full-time chef. With everything I just said, I take back when it comes to food and houses. <laughs> food and, but it's, it's not that. It's the watches and it's the cars and it's the... I agree. All the flashy items, all the shiny objects, all the shiny objects. And the Bible says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. How you make your money is more important than how much you make. So I think that's another thing that really is in the back of the minds of the frugal entrepreneur is they're so focused on the product, they're fo so focused on the mission, they're so focused, they're so focused on what they're trying to achieve that spending their money and, and buying all these luxuries, it barely crosses their mind. Jeff Bezos, I guarantee you, he wasn't thinking about buying Lambos or buying Bugattis or buying Porsches. He was just thinking about how do we build the most customer-centric company that the world has ever seen. That's what he did. So that's my perspective is frugality is a representation and a reflection of somebody who is focused on something more important than money. Do you think it could be used as a coping mechanism, your, mm. uh, your theory? You think it could be used as a coping mechanism to not do things for people around you? No, Bro, I'm talking I, I bought, more about self-spending. I bought my mom a, a fucking car. When did Jeff Bezos buy his mom a car? Probably when he was worth eight figures. Like <laughs> Probably that's, after his first million. Sorry, bro, that's gay. Like, I, don't, I don't have a better word to describe that. I'm sure you can think of a better word. Gay is the best word to describe that. <laughs> um, you can cut that out if you want. I'm not but, cutting anything. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to play my game. I'm stubborn. But it's not like I'm spending tons of money. I don't trap, like I don't go on huge trips. I don't do anything. I will buy my parents stuff when I think they need things. Yeah. But it's not, I don't have a Rolex. I told myself I would not buy a Rolex until my mom's retired. No Rolex. I like that. I no car. I don't have a car. One of my business partner's dad said he won't buy himself a Rolls Royce, which is his dream car, until he buys one of his employees a Rolls Royce. I thought that was really cool. Like, you don't get the nice thing until you get the nice thing for somebody else. 
that's a good that's a good challenge. I and cool. I think at that point you kind of deserve it. Perhaps it's not the extreme. Perhaps there's somewhere in the there middle. There is definitely somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Or it makes sense. But I'm not saying that I should, you should spend all your money. If I thought that, I would have a Lambo. Yeah. And a you would. Millie. Remember when you called me one time and you were like, dude, I just bought a Lambo. You did like your first 100K month profit and you were like, I bought a Lambo. I put a deposit on the Huracan. You were like, I'm happy for you, bro. <laughs> I was, I was just like, what is happening, bro? Dude could have given me a raise. The master is not the best in the world. The master is the man who creates the most masters. Ooh. Josh has surpassed me in profit, but it's because of me. <laughs> I'm the puppet master. <laughs> so you said something interesting to me earlier. You said that there's only two times that people ever need God. And there's a reason that most people never find God. Walk me through that again, because that was really, really insightful. Well, I asked you, what is the one time people seek God? When they're needy. When they're needy. When they're scared. When they're low. When they need something. Exactly. When they're weak. When they're weak. Now, what is the second time that people seek God or ask for help? Tell me. When they're chasing a goal that seems impossible mm. and they don't know how to build a plan to get there. Mm. So, and I guess I'll explain how I came to this. When I was thinking about exiting an SMMA for eight figures or, you know, building a portfolio of SMMAs or whatever, right? I never thought like, man, God, can you really help me put this plan in place? Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. It might sound really cocky, but like, I, I never thought that. And then recently, we've been talking about possibly going into politics and the potential of like being a US president to be a goal, right? It's a big goal. And then I found myself thinking, God, how the heck do I pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> that is really interesting. That is so interesting. So. And you said that people who don't think they need God aren't thinking big enough. Yeah. If you don't think and you're not seeking to find God, then either you've never been super low, right? Or you just don't have a goal that's big enough. Mm. It makes so much sense because what does God want? He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to honor him. The Bible says that God favors the foolish to humble the wise. God favors the weak to shame the strong. Mm. He favors the weak to shame the strong. Why? Because the strong are prideful. The Lord detests the proud of heart. But he honors the weak that come to him. He, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary, all who are, are hurt, come to me. So if you're not, and I've always thought about this with you because you said like, to me, a few months ago, you're like, I've never been in a moment where I was just like, God, I really need you. And that was honest. And I, I respect that. You're a strong person who figures things out. But then I thought to myself, well, perhaps it's because you're not thinking big enough. Perhaps it's because God has something so great in store for you that you have not had to lean on him yet. But there's something bigger that you will need him for. U.S. President... You need God for that one, brother. I need him. So I thought that was really interesting. And the Bible reflects this idea that you mentioned. The proud of heart don't need God. The people who think they don't need God will never find him. So it's very, very interesting that you said that. Do you feel like you found God? Do you feel like, do you think God's real? Of course. Of course. Most definitely. Why are you so confident? There has to be something that created this world. There has to be some kind of purpose we're here. There has to be, there's no, I just don't believe that we were created meaningless. I just, I, I don't believe it. And I choose not to believe it. Maybe I'm incorrect, but what does that do for me? That's why I don't understand about atheists, right? An atheist, let's, let's talk about the pros and the cons, right? And there's only one thing to talk about. Is God real or is God not real? Right? So when you die, you go to heaven's gates, 
if God is real and you're an atheist, you're fucked. <laughs> if God is real, you go to heaven's gates, and you are a Christian, a strong, loyal Christian, you're going to be accepted into heaven. We can talk about that. So what you just explained is something called Pascal's Wager. Have you heard of that? No. Blaise Pascal, the famous mathematician, this is exactly what he said. Pascal's Wager. There is more upside to me believing in God and God being real than to me not believing in God and God not being real. The risk-reward is off the charts to say God's real. Off the charts. Pascal's Wager. The problem is, and I say this as when, when I was an atheist, when I was a nihilist, I thought about this. And I said, yes, that is true, but... I will not believe in something that I don't actually believe in simply because of the risk reward. I only want to believe in something if I actually believe you in it. You have the conviction. And that's what I said. And I said it to God. I said, look, man, like if you're there, show me. I'll dedicate my life to you. I made that promise to God. I will dedicate my life to you. But I can't choose to believe in you if I don't actually. And it's crazy because I remember when I started seeking for the first time, Really seeking. The Bible says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. When I really started seeking God with all of my heart for the first time, I remember saying out loud, I prayed, I said, God, if you can convince me that you're real, you can convince anyone. <laughs> because I was so skeptical. I read the words of Jesus and I said, this guy's either a con man or he never even existed. I read the Bible and I said, I don't even, this probably isn't even real. I thought that Christianity was a scam. To some extent, religion is. But I was so adamant that it was not the case. But Because I would not deceive myself. I, I told myself, I will not deceive myself to believe something if I don't actually believe it. But now, as you know, I obviously actually believe. So it's a... It's an interesting thing that you propose, but I would challenge people, if you don't actually believe, if you do what, what you just did, I fear that the thing is deep down in your subconscious, you're not sure if you actually believe. Mm. And because of that, because the belief is not real, because the belief is not genuine, that affects your relationship with God because it's not a real relationship. It's fake, it's propped up. What if you didn't have to convince yourself? What if you didn't have to choose to believe? What if it was so obvious and in front of you that you were like, dude, I can't, dude, I try sometimes. Like, this has been happening to me the last couple weeks where I'm like, because of sin, I know sin is separation from God. And because of sin, I felt disconnected and I've started to like not feel that presence, that connection that I know I've had in the past. And I'm like, man, like, wait, what's up with this? What's going on? And when I start to think for a second, well, maybe God's just not even real. I can't even do it anymore, bro. I can't, even, I can't even begin to try to tell myself that there is no God. I've, there's been too much that has happened to me. There's been too many things to where I can't even begin to deny it. So what if that was possible for you rather than choosing to believe it? What if you would have to choose not to because it's so glaringly obvious in front of you? So what advice do you give to myself and anyone watching this that believes in God, understands that God is real, mm. but hasn't spent the time, A, to seek which is obviously on me, um, but also to have that feeling where it just feels so obvious, it's impossible not to believe. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So what is the best advice I can give to somebody? Seek him with all of your heart. King Solomon, the wisest, richest man who ever lived. All the, all the wise kings in the world would come to King Solomon and ask him for advice. He, see, he said... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He said, on top of that, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He also said, wisdom is like hidden treasure. It's like precious jewels. It's like hidden treasure. Seek it. Seek for wisdom like it's hidden treasure. So here's the question. If you would seek, imagine there was treasure hidden in this house, like billions of dollars of treasure. What would you and I be doing all day long when we're not working? Brother, we would be seeking. We'd be seeking for the treasure. <laughs> We'd be seeking our faces off trying to find the hidden treasure. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if wisdom is hidden treasure, 
and we're to seek it as so, then what are we seeking? The fear of the Lord. What should we be seeking? We should be seeking God. As if He is hidden treasure, because He is. It is the hidden treasure that is in life. It is the hidden opportunity that is here for all of us, is that you can have a relationship with the thing that created you. That is the hidden treasure that is in this world, that is offered to us. But how many people ever take the time to seek it? How many people ever set a time, set aside the time to actually go and look for the hidden treasure that's there? Obviously not enough. Myself not enough. included. Not enough. Because what is the devil great at? Deception. So what has he done? He's created a world. The Super Bowl. <laughs> it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> He's created a world that is focused on things in the world where they can never look up and see the things outside of the world. The Bible says, I think it's like Isaiah 44. It says, set your eyes on the heavens above. Ask yourself, who could have made these? All I have to do to find God is walk outside and look up. Who made this? <laughs> who made this? Who made these stars? Who made this planet? Who made these mountains in Costa Rica? Who made this beautiful world that we have? Who made it? But we get deceived by the cameras, by the phones, by the microphones, by the content, by the money, we get completely deceived and we'll go our whole lives falling victim to that deception, thinking that it's the most important thing that we can live for when there's something that actually created it, that is just waiting for us to seek Him. And it's the reason we're here and it is the most important thing because it's the whole reason we're here in the first place. So that's my advice. Prioritize the thing that created you rather than the thing that it's created. Prioritize the thing that's outside of the world rather than the things that are in it. Because everything in the world is impermanent. Even if you attain them, you will lose them. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his life? Because he knows that if you gain the whole world, you won't need God and you'll lose your life because of it. Your eternal life. And it's, it sounds so crazy for me to say this as somebody who was so nihilistic and so Buddhist and stoic and convinced that religion was a joke. But as I go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, I become more and more convinced every single day that it just, it's, sure, it's crazy. I'm not gonna pretend like it's an easy thing to believe, but if you do the research, if you seek, if you look, it just starts to make so much sense that it's so crazy, it might just be true. So that'd be my advice to you and other people. Clip that. <laughs> what do you think of that? I mean, I agree. I think that I need to, you know, allocate time to seeking. There is one thing I want to circle back to. You mentioned that religion, you believe, is mostly a scam? What well, yeah, that? because there's like 255 world religions and only one of them's true. Okay, and what is the reason why? What do you mean? Like, why are there so many religions? Why are there so many religions? Because what is the devil great at? Deception. You know the number one thing my dad says to me? My dad's an atheist. Big Sam Harris fan. When I talk to him about God, you know what he says to me? He that? says, there's so many religions, how could you know which one's right? Who do you think did that, bro? If the devil were a real person, what would he do? He'd give you so many paths to choose from that it'd be almost unreasonable to think you found the right one. So... That would be my response to all these religions, why there's so many, uh, is because, <laughs> dude, if Christianity is true, that means the devil's real. And if the devil's real, that means the things that he is set here to do are true, which means he is here to deceive. And do you he think does that, that by people that paths. are on the path of another religion, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, etc., do you think they're being led down, or down a path that will lead to death? Why do you think that? Because uh, it's not what I think. Jesus said very clearly, and what do you I, am the way th I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. I am the way. He said, I hate all false ways. Judaism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, Stoicism, Pantheism, false what, ways. What do you mean by it leads to death? I mean it leads to... What is death? The wages of sin are, is death, right? That's what Romans chapter 6, verse 13 says. It says, The wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin are death. What does that mean? Sin is separation from God. So what is death? 
if the wages of sin is death. It's the ultimate separation from God. That's all death is. It's separation from God. So when I say that these false religions lead to death, what I mean is that these false religions lead to eternal separation from the Lord. It does. What do you think about people that scholars and other religions that dedicate their life to Judaism, to Islam, to Buddhism? What do you say to them? Well, the elephant in the room is like one of us is wrong, if not both of us. So like I, I could be wrong. The scholars could be wrong. The atheist could be wrong. Somebody's wrong. We can't all be right. Atheism and theism and Judaism and Christianity can't all be true. So we have to really look at the evidence. Here's what's been interesting to me. I was not raised in a Christian household, far away from it. My dad's an atheist, my mom's an agnostic. The only reason I came to Christ was completely on my own and quite honestly on him. Like it wasn't me, it was, it was him and me choosing to follow what he was giving me. So that's what has made this experience so powerful for me is I can confidently say I was not indoctrinated into this. I was not manipulated into believing this. I came to this on my own accord, even though I had every predisposition not to believe. So the Jewish scholars, how many of them have actually came onto it in their own accord? How many of the Muslim scholars have came to it in their own accord? It's very rare. It seems to be very I'm sure rare. There are some. Now, now Islam is being becoming more and more populated because of people like Andrew Tate. But usually, like how many white Muslims do you know? Do you think Andrew Tate has had a big, big impact on people converting to, to Islam? I think people like Sneeko and people like Andrew Tate are making Islam slowly but surely the cool religion. And what, dude, I so clearly see the work of Satan when I see that. So clearly do I see the deception. Is that why you don't like them? It's not that I don't like them. I love them. I, I pray for them. I've prayed for Andrew Tate many times, and I will continue to do so. It's that I think they are, are misled. And I think, think because they they're intentions? misled, when a leader is misled, what does he do? He misleads his sheep as well. So I think it's dangerous to follow them because they themselves are misled. Why would you follow somebody you know is going down the wrong path? I know Tate's going down the wrong path. I know Sneak was going down the wrong path. Why would I ever follow them? I know they're deceived. Do you think they have bad intentions? I don't think they are following their own intentions. I think they're deceived and thus they are following the intentions of the one who has deceived them. And I don't mean I think they're possessed. I, th I mean, I think they have genuinely fallen victim to a path that does not lead to life, but leads to death. And whether or not it's their intention, that's the situation they've been put in. So how do we help them? What do we do? We pray. We pray. Do you think that... And we evangelize. If we ever get the chance to talk to Tate, we talk to him. Do you think that you could have good friends of another religion? Of course, dude. Like, I, I hope it doesn't come across as like, self-aggrandizing, morally righteous Christian, because that's the exact thing that I used to hate. Like, oh, you think you're superior because you found the truth and everybody else is wrong. Like, no, I, I, that used to turn me off so much. But when you become deeply convinced, what are you supposed to do, pretend you're not? So, yes, you can be, dude, my dad's an atheist. I love my dad. He's, he's better than most Christians. <laughs> he's way better than most Christians I know. He's one of the most Christ-like atheists I've ever met. I have most of my friends growing up were not Christian, were not followers. Most of the people I know in business aren't followers of Jesus. I have plenty of friends who aren't followers of Jesus. I have plenty of friends who are Muslim. But do you think you can ever have that connection with them? What connection? As in, you know, lifelong, I, I feel like with family it might be a, a bit different. It's, it's your father. But do you believe as you mature and as you grow in life that you'll even want to be around people that you truly believe are being led down the wrong path? Especially mm. as you grow, you're going to be around leaders. Everyone around you is a leader. Are we not all leaders? And if someone is of a opposing or another religion, that means that they are, in your terms, misleading their followers down a different religion. So do you Great believe question. that you can have a strong connection with someone that as you grow, as leaders are around you that follow someone different than Jesus. Great question. Here's, here's the question I would ask myself and anybody listening is, well, if we don't ever associate with people who have different beliefs than us, 
how are we ever supposed to spread our beliefs effectively? If I only ever associate with other Christians, what good is that doing Christ? So I think it's my responsibility as a Christian to go forth, yea, and spread the gospel as Jesus commanded, which does not mean spread the gospel to people who already believe the gospel. It means spread the gospel to people who don't believe the gospel. So I, I think those are the very people I feel called to serve, is the, is the Muslim, is the Hindu, is the atheist, is the Buddhist, is the Stoic, because I was so many of those. I have a Quran. <laughs> you know? I looked into Buddhism for a long time and followed it. I looked into Stoicism. I want to help those people more than anything. See, I have an odd perspective where I'm someone that's not a super devout Christian. Right? So I believe in talk God. talk to me about it. I believe in God. Okay. Actually, well, my grandfather, my mom's Jewish. My dad's Christian, but I grew up going to youth group, going to church every so often. I yeah. used to wear a cross, right, growing up. But I respect anyone that follows God. Now, whether that's with Prophet Muhammad or with Jesus Christ, or as long as they're following one God, I respect them. But because the normally they're following a book of rules, and they're staying disciplined to that, um, to that book of rules. And normally someone that, when they congregate in a synagogue or a church or a temple or wherever it is. If I said I was following a liar, would you respect me for following a liar? The thing is, I don't think these people are liars because I'm not convicted. No, I'm not saying the, the Muslim's a liar. I'm saying the Prophet Muhammad is the liar. <laughs> They're following a liar. They've been deceived. But at a certain extent, when do we just think this is in the real world, who has good intentions, who is making good for the people around them, who is having impact. How do you define what's good? I define something that's tangible as doing good. So for example, giving back to people in poverty, providing education for people that don't have the opportunity. Sounds very Christ-like. I love Yes, it. but at the end of the day, when can we get away from everyone fighting over X, Y, and Z person that was in our past and heaven's gates? What if we focus on where we are now in today's world and impacting the people around me, around us? Why do we have to strongly dislike people of another religion that are donating millions of dollars of charity to help people like us? Great question. So again, why do I, we have I, to have that division? I hope, That's it devil. I hope it doesn't come across as I don't like those people. Like, dude, I have so many Muslim friends. I talk to them to this day. Like, I love them. I love them. I love those people. Yeah. I love those people enough to disagree with them, even though it's uncomfortable. My question, to answer your question, why do we have to focus on who are we following rather than just doing good? My question to you would be, what good is doing good if there is no eternity? If 99.9% .9 of species on this planet have gone extinct, 99.9%. .9 but for me, that feels like nihilism. I am here on this earth, and I want to impact the people around me and provide a better life for them. Because there's a reason you're here. Because there's a purpose for you being here. If there was no purpose, 99.9% .9 of species have gone extinct. If there is no God, then we're bound to just be the next one, and that's that. But if there is a God, then it's different then everything we do here matters. It's the opposite of nihilism. The question is, who are we following and why? If you're following the wrong God, you're probably gonna go down the wrong path. You're probably gonna lead people the wrong way. You might do good things, but ultimately, that's going to lead you to eternal separation from God. So, the, the reason I think it matters who we're following is because if the promises of the Bible or, or the Quran or the Torah are true, then that means there is one way, one key way to that life. And if one of, just one of those books is true, then our job should be to find that way. And if none of them are true, then it doesn't matter. Nihilism is true. That's the scary thing. If there is no God, nihilism is true. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian philosopher, said, Without God, everything is permissible. He was right. Without God, everything is permissible. There's no repercussions because there's no rules. How can you have a law without a lawgiver? 
I mean, I have an interesting question. Okay. Who do you think is a better man? Random person in the middle of Nebraska that lives by himself in the wilderness that is a strong follower of Christ. Okay. But he doesn't know anyone. He lives in the forest. Or someone that believes and thinks that Christ and God is not real. A nihilist. I'm not saying he puts on social media and and, and impacts people, but he gives tens of millions of dollars away to charity. Great question. And he helps people in poverty. Great question. This is an amazing question. Who do you think is a better man? Again, I don't want to give my opinion. I want to base on what the scriptures tell us. Oh, man, I wish I could pull up the exact book and the exact verse. But I believe it was Paul or Christ. Somewhere in the New Testament, it said that whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is who loves me. So it's, he talks about the Gentiles. In the, in the New Testament, the Gentiles were the people who didn't, they weren't Jewish. They were the non-Jews because Judaism was the only main religion at the sure. time. So the Gentiles were the non-Jews. And he said, Gentiles who do the acts get more favor from God than from the people who profess with their words but have nothing to show for it. Because Jesus said, "Those who love, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He talks about, I think it's Matthew chapter 7, he says, many will come to me in that time and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform a great many miracles in your name? And he will say to them, get away from me, I never knew you. Lord, Lord, what's interesting about that is in Aramaic, when you say a word twice, you're really trying to emphasize it, to say you really like that word. That word means a lot to you. So people who say, Lord, Lord, those are like the missionaries of today. But people who say, Lord, Lord, are the people who are on fire for God. So the people who are coming to Jesus in this parable are, Lord, 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 the people on fire for Jesus. And he says to them, get away from me, I never knew you. So I think the Lord judges, the man judges the outward appearance, but the Lord judges the heart. It all comes down what to the posture that guy of the in heart. Col- in, in Colorado, strong belief in this. I'm great sure man he'll be. Heart. I'm sure he'll be fine. I'm sure he'll be fine. But it all depends. On, is he following the commandments of the Lord? Everybody has their own role. Everybody has their own role, and we know by Romans eight twenty eight. Romans 8.28, Paul says, For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and live according to His purpose for them. So if that man is living according to his purpose for with God, by living in the woods, falling out whatever he's supposed to do, maybe he writes, maybe he chops down trees, maybe he raises a small little family, whatever. Maybe just read scripture all day, just to sit there and worship God. If he's living according to the purpose that God has called him to, we know that all things work together for good. Does that make him a better man than someone who's a nihilist that takes care of his community? Or someone that follows Islam and gives millions of dollars away to people in need? It is not for man to judge, but for God. And what do you think God would say? I think that'd be heresy if I tried to answer. <laughs> I think it'd be blasphemy if I tried to tell you what, what God would do with that man. Because the truth is we don't know. The truth is we don't know. But Which would you rather be? I'd rather be the one following God. Really? Yes. You would be rather because be the what's man the most valuable God. thing? What's the most valuable thing you can give to somebody? Money or eternal life? At what point is that selfish? You would rather be the man in the middle of the forest in Colorado that reads scripture all day, rather than the man that impacts the world. Well, you tell me this: if God has called you to read scripture all day and you would rather donate money to other people, what's selfish? Which one are you doing for yourself and which one are you doing for God? What about the others around you? What about all the food that you can deliver to kids that can't eat? You know, what an interesting thing that are dying? An interesting thing happened to me when I first started believing. I really was like somewhat interested in Christ because I was like, well, maybe this is my purpose. And maybe like God wants me to help change the world and do all these great things. And I called this lady one day. Crazy story, but Long story short, I call this lady and I start telling her all these things like, yeah, I feel like God like really like needs me. This is when I was a nihilist. I was like, maybe if there is a God, I had a crazy sign happen to me. And I was like, well, if there is a God, maybe he needs me to help him. And the lady says, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. 
he's completely fine, but he wants you. So we have to trust what the Bible says. Things will go according to God's plan. Things will go according to the way that God has set them out to be, with or without us. What God wills will happen. And I have enough faith to believe that exactly what God wants to happen in this earth will happen in this earth. The people who will be saved will be saved. The people who aren't, aren't. I will do my best according to how He calls me to do whatever He wills me to do. But I'm not going to choose what I think is right because that's pride. I know better than God. I know better than God. And that's exactly what happened to Satan. That's why it's called original sin. Satan was kicked out of heaven because he thought he knew better than God. God kicked him out. He made him God of the earth. So what are your top 10 niches for SMMA in 2024? <laughs> I think the desire in your heart is a very righteous one and you really want to serve people and you really want to do good and I think that comes from God because where else does it come from? Like where does this idea of like really wanting to help people that you clearly have, where, where does that come from and how is that right unless there's an ultimate source of right? George Washington said you cannot reason without first arriving at a supreme being. I find that to be a fascinating quote. You cannot reason. One cannot reason. One cannot be reasonable without first arriving at a divine source of reason, an ultimate source of right, wrong, good, bad. So this feeling that you have of like, these things are right, these things are wrong, that has to come from an ultimate source of it. So I think- I agree with that. I think the desires you have are from God and he will use you in ways that are incredible. And he already is starting to, but it will become even more incredible and it will make even more sense to you when you're doing it with him and for him, knowing it with a relationship with him at, at the same time. Because everything you're saying to me sounds very righteous, but I would just have to ask, where does the righteousness come from? I think that's a good question. I would agree with you. I think it does come from God. I just, it's, we spoke a little while back and you were contemplating, hey, is continuing growing businesses the way that I serve God? Yes. Or is this being selfish because I want to make money? I want to do X, Y, and Z. Should I just quit, be a preacher and preach the gospel? Yeah. Right? You went through that. How did you decide? And what if you're wrong? What if it is being preaching the gospel? How are you so sure? The Lord judges the heart. So the Bible says that the, man, the plans of man are many, but in the end it is the Lord's will that will be established. So whatever my plans are, ultimately the will of the Lord will be established. I have the faith in that. The second is, Solomon said in Proverbs, Man's mind creates the plan, but the Lord directs the steps. So whether I am preaching, whether I am going into business, no matter what I am doing, if I'm doing it with God and for God, it's right. Commit your plans to the Lord and they will be established, is what Solomon said. Commit your plans to the Lord and they will be established. So if I'm committing myself to God as a preacher, as an entrepreneur, Whatever. If I'm committing my plans to God, they will be established. Because if they're committed to God, then it's His will. And the will of the Lord is what's established. And how did you come to... Business? Yeah. I didn't have a good reason for thinking business was not the move. So I started to feel like, man, maybe this is some spiritual warfare. Maybe there's some deception happening that's trying to get me off the thing I'm really supposed to do. Because I kept questioning it, but I didn't have a good reason why. The other thing is, when I walked into church for the first time on my own accord. This is a crazy story. This is part of a much crazier story. It's a small part. But when I walked into church for the first time on my own accord, it was Easter Sunday last year. Walk into church. The whole reason I got to that church in the first place is, God, wild. But I walk in and it's a prophetic church. They prophesy, speak in tongues, all this crazy stuff that I didn't even know existed, dude. <laughs> 
And I go and I get a prophetic reading that day. You go sit down in a room and these people will sit there and tell you like what they think God is saying to you. And I was like, all right, fortune tellers. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> let's hear it. Because I'm still nihilist at the time, still atheist. I'm like, all right, okay, let's see what you got. I sit down and I recorded it on my phone. They let me record it. I have the recording on my phone. They say three things to me. They say, we see you have a gift for money. We see you have a gift for business. And we see you have a gift for teaching. Two weeks prior, I started my YouTube channel teaching people how to make money through business. And I got a comment a week before I went to church that said, Matt, after listening to your podcast and watching your videos, I think you're a teacher at heart. And I screenshotted it. Randomly, I was just like, that one comment stuck out to me. I was like, teacher at heart. I screenshotted it. Then these people go and say to me, money, business, teaching. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> How many times have you yeah, got prophetic uh, words? I'll tell you a crazy one that you're actually involved in. You don't even know this. I've never told you this. What? This is wild. Where are you going with this? <laughs> I've gotten prophetic words a handful of times, but I know people have gotten much crazier prophetic words than I have. I got Jared and Chris got prophetic words. You told me that. Yeah, that was insane. Two weeks ago, when I got baptized, the prophet, like, <laughs> that was insane. <laughs> so the prophetic word that you're involved in happened at a church in Wilmington, North Carolina. There's this place called Morningstar. It's the one I went to in Charlotte that said money, business, and teaching. And then I went to that same church in Wilmington, also Morningstar, but a much smaller version of it. Just happened to be the only other like Morningstar location was in Wilmington, 10 minutes from where I was living at the time. Charlotte is where I used to live, which is where the other Morningstar is, which was the one all my friends went to. And just interesting coincidence, coincidence. But I went to Morningstar in Wilmington and in the middle of the service, I'm upstairs with my buddy. Everybody else is downstairs. We're like upstairs in the loft. In the middle of the service, the preacher points at me. And he says, hey, you in the, the white shirt, I, I think I got a word for you. And he starts giving me a prophetic word. And he says, I see this pastor's face on your face. I see this preacher. I forget what the what the church was that this guy led, ministry was, but he said, I see this pastor's face on your face. This is a preacher who saved a lot of people from human trafficking and sex trafficking. He helped a lot of people. And I think I saw his face come over your face because you're going to help a lot of people that are in need of it. I had just bought the domain Serve Others like a few weeks before. So that was very interesting. <laughs> then another preacher says, there's three of them. Another one says, I'm seeing just do it, just do it. Like the Nike logo is just on you. I'm seeing just do it. That's kind of vague, but it really spoke to me because there was something I was hesitant about that I, wasn't, I couldn't decide if I wanted to do it or not. He said, just do it. The last one, the interesting one, the preacher, this third guy, who wasn't even a preacher, he was there in the service. I went to the bathroom, shook his hand, and next thing you know, he's like, dude, I got a word for you. He comes up in the service. He's like, hey, well, while the preachers are at it, I got something for you too. After I talked to him like five minutes earlier, he's like, dude, I think I got something for you. So now I got all three of the preachers in the middle of the service just telling me these words, speaking to my heart. And this guy says, I see you with a group of younger people surrounding, surrounding you, sitting, listening to you talk about how God changed your life. What happened in Miami at the very end of our talk at Agency Lab? You, for some reason, out of all the questions you could have asked, chose to ask me, Matt, how has God changed your view of making money, business, and life? And I got to sit there for a second and tell my story, a synopsis of it, of how God has changed my life with a room full of 200 like, young people. There's a ton of teenagers there because it's SMMA. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. And 
that was like three months after I got that word of, I see young people sitting down listening. Like how many people, how many 22 year olds can you say that to? And it, it happens. I see a group, I see a lot of young people listening to you talk about your story of how God has changed your life. Sure, that could happen at a youth group, that could happen at a church, that, that could happen in a lot of ways. But Have you ever got any words that didn't make sense or didn't come true? I'd say I probably have had words that haven't made sense. I haven't gotten a ton of words. I've gotten like three or four. But every time they've made sense. Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Every time. There hasn't been a time where I'm like, eh, I think you're wrong about that one, buddy. Not yet. i got to take you to this church. I'm down. It, dude, Jared went there. And I, this is, I was still, dude, even after all of this, I was like, I don't know about this God guy, man. I was like, I don't know about all this. I was so stubborn, so hard-hearted. And I said, I'm going to take Jared to this church. If Jared gets a word about public speaking or politics, God's real. That's what I said before going to the church. Seriously. I take Jared in there. You don't sign in. You don't do anything. There's no getting your name. Yeah. <laughs> but Jared had never been there before. I didn't know anybody at the church that well. I bring Jared and his friend Jason into the church. And in the middle of the service, he points at Jared. The preacher points at Jared. And he says, hey, I'm seeing you have a gift for like coaching and speaking. Jared hadn't said a word. <laughs> you have a gift for coaching and speaking and either you're going to do it or you're doing it right now. Of course, I can't tell you how many people have had say to me, Jared sounds like a future president. He just gives off preacher vibes. He gives yeah, off yeah, like president does. vibes. Yeah. And then they look at Jason, Jared's friend, and I didn't know this. But they look at Jason and they point at him and they say, and I'm seeing you have a gift for politics and you're going to do a lot of good through the political realm. Jason, apparently, is even more into politics than Jared is. And his whole goal in life is to bring like Christ-like behavior into politics and make a difference through the political realm. He was on like the debate team and um, mock EU or whatever, like all, the, all that stuff growing up. And his whole thing is to get into politics. They point at him, they say that. They point at Jared and they say speaking and coaching. And I'm just sitting there, literally the biggest smile on my face, like, <laughs> bro, what's, like, at some point it becomes, well, what's more likely? What's more likely? That it's all just a coincidence, that we're all just here for nothing, that none of this matters, that it's all just, oh, blah, 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 just happened to happen. We happen to have consciousness. We happen to be able to have ex ex uh, existential crises. And... That's just the way the world is. There's just a sky and an earth and water and the sun, and it's just all there. Or maybe, maybe the reason the Bible is the best-selling book of all time is because it's true. So after a certain point, you just gotta, you can't deny it anymore, and that's, that's where I'm the at. The eagle story was kind of crazy too. The eagle story is crazy. Yeah. Should I share that one? Go ahead. We've gone deep into, uh, well, we've gone deep into religion and and spirituality, but. We can do it next time, too. We'll do another one, too. We can dive deeper into SMMA, give the people what they want. Yeah. 10K month. What's the best niche? How do best, I sell? The best niche? Following Christ. 